Welcome everybody to CIHT's uh, webinar for International Women in uh, Engineering Day and a happy day to all of us today. And I just want to welcome you all to this um, webinar and introduce myself. I'm Sue Percy, I'm the Chief Executive of the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation. And I'm delighted that um, today we're going to be doing a webinar on a topic that affects so many women and certainly affects me during all of my career and continues to do so. So it doesn't really matter what position you hold. I think imposter syndrome is something that actually we all have to struggle with and deal with and have strategies to get um, through. So I'm really keen that we explore what it is how we um, experience it, because people experience it differently, and um, the impact it has had on women, particularly um, during their careers or at the start of their careers, and any coping strategies that we can talk about and support each other um, through this. So I'm absolutely delighted to be um, chairing today's um, webinar and to be joined by my fellow panelists, who I will introduce to you a little later. Um, but I wanted to start by just getting a quick overview of what we mean by imposter syndrome. And so I'm going to hand over to Emma Carruthers, who's CIHT's EDI manager, who's just going to run through some slides with us to make sure that we understand what um, um, imposter syndrome really means. And then I'm going to introduce our panelists and we're going to open it up for a discussion. And if you've got any um, questions, please just post them um, and we will take those afterwards as well, because this should be quite an informal session where do feel free to ask whatever you like. Um, there's never uh, any questions that um, we wouldn't want to, to consider. So please do ask away. So, Emma, do you want to do the poll now or afterwards, after your presentation? I'll do that, um, the first couple of polls after my slides, if that's okay, Sue. Okay, great. Okay, well, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. First of all, as Sue has already alluded to, before we hear from our panellists, I'd like to talk to you about the theory of so-called imposter syndrome, its origins, and how it has evolved in terms of context. So I'm going to start by showing and sharing a few slides. OK, so back in 1978, American based psychologists Rose Clance and Suzanne Imes developed the concept. Sorry, Emma, having... we don't. We don't have those slides, unfortunately. I think you've just turned your camera off accidentally. Can you see them now? Thank you, Kira. Um, that's your camera. Let me let me do it one second. Turn your camera back on for me. Done. One second. Is that okay? So people can see my slides now? I've, I've shared them for you. We can. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. So thank you for that, Kira. So in, in 1978, American-based psychologists Rose Clance and Suzanne Imes developed the concept of imposter phenomenon, which was a term that was used to designate an internal experience of intellectual phonies and phoniness, which appears to be particularly prevalent and intense amongst a select sample of high achieving women. So this was despite outstanding accomplishments and evidence of achievement, real intellect and proven ability. Women persist in believing that they are not bright and have fooled anyone who thinks otherwise. 
the group experienced intense feelings of inadequacy and fraudulence that override evidence of success and proven ability. So more recent academic research and, and, and wider public discourse refers now to the term imposter syndrome in the last decade or so. So who is affected? Well, the founding study focused on a group that was classified as professional and pre-professional women. Initially, Clance and Ives regarded imposter phenomenon as experienced exclusively by women. Although Clance later published a research paper acknowledging that this is not unique to women. So anyone can experience imposter syndrome regardless of things like gender identity, age, ethnicity or social background. It can be quite a common experience. For example, when starting new job roles, new projects at work, promotion <coughs> within academia and even within relationships and families, as we may experience an element of self-doubt and low confidence and questioning whether we are good parents, good caregivers or good partners. Imposter syndrome disproportionately, however, does affect more women than men. And the phenomenon occurs with much less frequency in men. And that when it does occur, it is which, with, with much less intensity. So in 2019, sorry, a STEM women white paper concluded and reported that 54% of respondents declined to even answer whether they had ever suffered imposter syndrome or experienced imposter syndrome in any way. This suggests that around half of the respondents were either unfamiliar with what imposter syndrome is or still don't feel or didn't feel comfortable in talking about it. 34% of respondents answered yes, and this highlighted a, a real lack of confidence or feeling of being out of place as the main catalysts. So women's intersectionality can really amplify the effects of imposter syndrome. We know that women are far from a homogenous group and imposter syndrome can affect women more so who had who have the various added diversity dimensions such as ethnicity social background disability and so on so why are people affected especially women by imposter syndrome well it is down to and originates from things like social categorization from infanthood unhelpful and old-fashioned traditional gender stereotyping and biases interactions with other with others from formative years within families for example personality traits can increase vulnerability to imposter syndrome things like perfectionism for example high expectations from family and early childhood dynamics within families for example, real high expectations within academia. Where someone has grown up in an environment where you didn't see yourself represented in the media, within leadership roles or in important positions. And this lack of representation, visual representation, can really elicit personal doubts of that suitability. And I'd just like to reference Dr. Camilla Davies Rosenthal's um, link there um, towards the bottom of that slide. So Dr. Um, Davies Rosenthal unfortunately couldn't join us as, as a speaker today, but she has encouraged us to share with um, everyone, the delegates today, her work. So how can someone experience imposter syndrome? Someone may experience thoughts, for example, I'm a fraud. Well, they'll eventually find me out. I can't do this. I don't deserve to be here. I'm only here because of luck. I'm only here to meet diversity quotas. I must not fail. 
someone may experience imposter syndrome and um, involve, identify and put in place negative maladaptive coping mechanisms, including overworking, real procrastination. So overworking cre can create a real issue with work-life balance in boundaries. Procrastination can be really, really counterproductive in the world of work. Perfectionism, a distrust of others and an inability to relinquish responsibility, for example, with other people. A real comparison to others and what they see in other people. People can internalise constructive feedback and catastrophise even minor errors. Negative self-talk and people can rebuke any type of praise and acknowledgement and attribute and externalise the successes, attributing them to others' input or sheer luck. People can halt or delay any career progression or stay within a comfort zone. People can experience really low self-esteem, poor self-efficacy, self-doubt, but not always as people who experience imposter syndrome, as we know, can often be really high achievers. Imposter syndrome is not an official clinical diagnosis or disorder recognised by um, clinical diagnostic tools such as DSM or ICD-5, which are UK and American based um, classification tools. But psychologists do acknowledge the genuine and really specific form of intellectual self-doubt that can lead to anxiety or depression and they treat, they can go on to treat both of those symptoms, a range of symptoms. Imposter syndrome really can hold women back professionally as they may remain within a role that they are really comfortable with, rather than pushing the limitations in a positive way. So before we hear from our panellists, I would like to share my reflection on imposter syndrome. So by breaking the cycle of imposter syndrome internally and individually, and in driving the positive, meaningful and sustained change within workplaces and organisations, we can and should collectively alter structures and systems to make them much more welcoming and accepting of women. So beyond tokenistic tolerance, to create a genuine sense of belonging, as indeed it should be. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, um, Emma, for, for that a really helpful um, overview. Because um, certainly during my career, um, imposter syndrome wasn't really spoken about, but I can really resonate with the sort of that feeling of, you know, um, um, you know, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm a fraud. Perhaps, you know, someone's better at this than me, or you know, they'll find me out. I think we've all experienced that from from time to time. So, um, thank you very much, Emma, for that um, overview. And I hope, actually, for all of us on on the webinar today, you sort of get a get a feeling that you're not alone if you have ever experienced uh, feelings like that particularly when working in, in what is still a, a pretty male dominated uh, sector as well. So thank, thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to ask um, Emma to launch two polls because we just want to get your, your views on um, things at the start of this webinar. And then we want to then just double check with you at the end. So the first question we have for you is, have you experienced imposter syndrome? So please do select uh, one of the, the buttons, uh, and do do that now. I, I'm hoping that everybody has cast their uh, votes. Perhaps we can move on to the second uh, question now, second poll. 
So the second one is again, if you could um, just uh, fill this out, how confident do you feel in identifying and applying positive coping strategies to overcome imposter syndrome? So again, if you can vote for you're very confident, confident or not confident, that would be great. Thank you. Just give everybody just a, a couple more seconds to cast their vote. Okay, if we can close that now, that would be great. And can we just have a look at the results if we've got them, please? Do we have a, that's it, great. Um, so let me just uh, move that down. So have you experienced imposter syndrome? Oh, well, 90% of us certainly have. 5% you're the lucky ones haven't and 5% uh, not not sure. So majority on this um, webinar, we've, we've been in that position where we're thinking, crikey, you know, um, I'm feeling like a fraud and, uh, and so forth. So um, that's good to know. Next result, please, on the second uh, question that we asked. That one didn't work, unfortunately, Sue. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, well ne never mind. But we know um, if you can take that down now. Um, we know that um, we we have a lot of us who uh, uh, suffer from imposter syndrome. And uh, when I was sort of thinking about this, um, it was it was sort of you know what why why do we all feel like this? And some of it is because you know um, I look around and I have um, you know people who are just absolutely brilliant at what they do and then i do that comparison thing thinking they know far more than i do they they you know they can do it much better than i can do and the other thing also i think it you know for others it's around uh, perfectionism well i must do everything to and it must be perfect all the time and that puts a huge huge pressure on us all so there's lots of reasons i think um that that um, we suffer with imposter syndrome but helping us to explore this, and I'm delighted uh, that we have two um, panellists with us today and, uh, and also our immediate past president, Deborah Sims, who's coming in for our uh, video recording, who can't be here today. But let me just introduce you to the panellists. So, Helen Samuels, um, welcome Helen. Um, Helen is Managing Director uh, for EKFB. Uh, and that's part of Keir Construction. And uh, Helen is um, the managing director of that joint uh, venture between a, a, a number of leading civil engineer and construction engineering companies. But I should say, say Helen has been with Keir since I think January 2021 um, and as their technical director. So um, Helen, you're very welcome. We look forward to your contribution to, to this discussion and debate. Equally, I'm very happy to welcome Helen Townend. Um, Helen is director, technical director and EDI lead for Amy Consulting. And I believe, Helen, you're also chair of Women at Amy Network. And I know there's lots of other things um, that, that um, are very, very relevant to this discussion, but I won't go through them now. I think all your details are up on our website. But to Helen, um, but, well, to the two Helens, you are most welcome. I'm really looking forward to, to what you have to say. So I'm going to start actually with Helen Samuels. Um, and I'll just ask you to say a few words on your experience as well. OK, thanks ever so much, Sue. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here. It was really interesting listening to um, Emma's words of wisdom because it all rings very true. Um, um, I've certainly suffered from imposter syndrome, probably more in my mid-career. Um, than uh, when I was first starting out as a new graduate, but certainly in my mid-career, um, excruciating bouts of imposter syndrome. Um, but most people who know me well um, will say that I hide it really well, and I think I probably do. I come across as very confident and articulate. Um, it's very stressful um, putting in place all of those coping mechanisms. And, you know, for me, I think um, the cause of the imposter syndrome is a mixture of internal factors and external factors. So as women growing up, 
we're very much um, celebrated as being quiet and pretty and well behaved and studious. Um, whereas um, little boys tend to be very much um, encouraged to be brave and fast and sporty. Um, and I think that that has an ingrained impact on, on women growing up and that we end up with a, a very different appetite to risk. And I know that for me, um, I don't have a great uh, risk appetite and I do have a, a, a quite a debilitating fear of failure. Um, and, and so you have to be really careful to counteract that. And then I think the, the kind of the external factors are the behaviours of, of others, which quite often, to be fair, are unconscious bias. So I'm sure that many of us on the on the webinar will recall, time, recall times when um, in my favourite phrase, let me interrupt your competence with my confidence or your expertise with my confidence. Um, when you're talking to somebody who's less qualified than you are and they just can't wait to tell you what they think about the subject that you're an expert and there's no malice in it um, but there are some people quite often men but not always but quite often men oh, I'm just sorry it's my phone going off Should have muted that. Um, and and, it, and and like I say it's unconscious um, but it really knocks your confidence because you know you know more about the subject than they do and then the other factor that quite often happens is if you're in a you know a senior level meeting, maybe a boardroom, and um, you speak up to make a point um, that you're very qualified to make, and it, it's as if you've not spoken, it's as if you've got this cloud of invisibility around you, and you've made a point, you think it's a very well argued point, and it's brushed over, it's not recognised, and then two minutes later there'll be a, there'll be somebody else in the room, and again, unfortunately, quite often it will be a man um, who will make exactly the same point as you. And everybody is fascinated um, and that can that can really knock your confidence as well but I, as I say it's nearly always unconscious bias that causes that so I think those are kind of internal external um, uh, you know for me I find I have some personal triggers um, so you've got the causative factors which are kind of like ongoing but the but the kind of triggers if I'm you know if I've had a if I've had a knock you know, uh, in, in confidence, something's not gone well at work or I've been given some criticism that I found it hard to deal with. Um, that's not great. Um, for me, uh, obviously, the behaviour of others can, can, can sometimes impact me. But the other thing that's perhaps a little bit less comfortable for us to talk about is I certainly have a hormonal response. Um, now, I'm in the middle of menopause now, so that's great fun. Um, but even before that, there would be certain times of the month when um, I would I would have feelings of paranoia and insecurity. Um, and that's nothing to be ashamed of, but uh, being aware of it, I found was really helpful. Um, and certainly now I'm, I'm popping the HRT, so that, that certainly helps. Um, and just to, just to kind of close really, because I, you know, I know we want to uh, get onto questions and answers and hear from, hear from, my, from, from the other Helen. Um, you know, personal co coping strategies. Um, it is really helpful to have someone to talk to. Um, whether that's somebody, I, I've not been a massive fan of formal mentors, but I know that works really well for some people. But I've always had, you know, a couple of three people who I can go and talk to as informal coaches um, or sponsors, normally more senior to me, not always in the business, sometimes outside of the business that I could just talk to. Um, I always make sure I've got something in my personal portfolio that I'm really good at and that I really enjoy doing. And that's not always within work, something that I know I can do, feel confident about know that I am the expert in the room and it to be within an environment where I'm treated with, with, with respect because I can then use that as a benchmark to compare with areas where I feel that I'm perhaps a little bit less confident. So, you know, that might, for example, be uh, sitting on a, a industry advisory board, maybe for a university or a board of governors for a school, um, working groups, um, you know, maybe running a graduate group, you know, something where I feel I can bring real value um, and I enjoy, and then that to me is a bit of a buffer for some of the areas of, of, uh, of confidence. Uh, and then the other thing I, that I have a benefit from in the past is um, it's just some personal coaching. And sometimes that's in your communication style. So giving you coping mechanisms for when you start to feel it welling up and the coping strategies to bring your anxiety levels down so that your communication isn't impacted. Because if your communication shows that you're, that you're not confident, um, and that you're insecure, you end up in a spiral quite often um, that you then feel like you can tell that you're not coming across well and then that kind of impacts you as well. So communication style coaching can really help. Um, and then just to close really to say it gets better as you get older and it gets better as you get more senior and I'm much more comfortable in my skin 
than I ever was, um, you know, when I was when I was younger coming up through my career. So if that's a, a message of hope for everybody. It definitely gets easier as you get a bit longer in the tooth, like I am, 800 years old, whatever I am. Thank you. Over to you, Sue. Great. Thank you so much, um, Helen, for, for that. And I think it's so um, helpful to share um, your own personal experiences because sometimes when I'm um, at events and, and things, you know, I think, am I the only one feeling like this? Um, and and um, I take a lot of a strength, actually, um, from talking to other women particularly um, and, and realising I'm not the only one who sort of like thinks, oh, crikey, you know, what am I doing here? And what really resonates with me is that um, sitting around a, a table, um, mainly dominated by men because of the sector that we work in, and as you quite rightly say, you, you raise an issue, you, you talk about it, you get a few nods, and then you find five minutes later, um, the person, you know, the man down, down a few, few seats down from you says the same thing, and everyone says, that's a brilliant point. And I feel that sort of uh, students say, no, I made that earlier. But, you know, that, that's, that's what you do have to cope with. Um, uh, I, I completely agree. And I, I really liked your point about hormonal fluctuations and that how that affects us all um, at different points in our, um, our, our careers. That's a really, and that's something that I don't think gets talked about very much either. And, and recognising that and not needing to be apologetic about that. That's who we are and how we're made up. So, so many thanks for that. That was great. So I'd like to turn now to the other Helen, actually, and um, ask you to, um, you know, pass on some of your reflections and share those with us as well. Thank you. I'm afraid we can't hear you, Helen. Um, I there it is. I'm, I'm... Oh, there we are. Yeah, we've got you yeah. now. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sue, and thanks, Helen. As mentioned, we can all feel out of our debt sometimes um, and worry that we're a fraud or, or found out or not good enough. And, and as today's poll shows, you know, it's OK. Uh, there's a, a stat out there, 86% of all executives admit they, have suffered from, they suffer from uh, imposter syndrome. Uh, and interestingly, I've not had that conversation with women that I work with, um, but I've often had it with my senior male, male colleagues who will kind of go, oh, yeah, I've got that. Or, you know, how did I get managed to get in this role? And perhaps we see it as a gender issue because we know more men than women who brave it out to make sure they get to the top and they, they keep sort of hiding it a little bit more. But actually the women at the top are also hiding it so you know we, we we've got to be very um clear with that but in women i think imposter syndrome probably plays out in slightly different way than it does with men and it's possible possibly that it's even more detrimental to our career progression we know that statistically men apply for a job when they meet only 60 percent of the qualifications requested on the job description but women apply only if they meet 100%. Meet so as women, we are less likely to push ourselves out of our comfort zone and apply for that next role unless we feel sure of success. So I think there's lots of reasons for that. You know, we're juggling so many things in our lives and we don't want to upset a balance when we've got it under control. Um, you know, school, work, home, that whole triangle. So and there's also like, oh, well, you know, I'm busy. I don't have time to learn a new role. I may not be able to do it. What if I fail? And all of these things are imposter syndrome in, under a different guise, really. You haven't got there yet, but you're not pushing yourself there either. So how do we get into that mindset that says we deserve that next promotion? We are confident enough. We, we're ready and we're able to achieve that next level. Self-confidence, I think, only comes with practice. You really have to try to get become confident. Um, so how do you decide? How, 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 how do you get there? Well, I think we should all decide to say yes for the rest of the year. 26 months. Say yes to every stretch project you see in the horizon. Ask to be involved. Step out of your comfort zone at every opportunity. Say yes to speaking events like this. 
uh, whether it's in your office, just standing up in a team meeting and, off and sharing your best practice or celebrating something that you've done or an external event. Speaking at events that are external, like the CIHT events that, that we hold locally, build your network. It builds your credibility and your visibility in the industry. And it also builds your confidence. But also something else that Helen said, become the expert in the room. Be the person that people look for for the solutions. This sounds harder than it actually is. As soon as you're given a project to work on, you become the expert of that project. As soon as you start researching it, going into the detail, you now know more than anybody else. You know more than your line manager, you know more than your boss, you know more than your client. You are the subject matter expert for that project. So you need to own that knowledge and use it to find the best solution and take your solution to the next meeting. And then everybody in that meeting will be there to be listening to you. And so you won't feel like an imposter because you are the person that they want to hear from. In doing this, you'll also become a role model for other women in our sector. And it sounds a bit scary, but just remember, nobody likes putting themselves out there. Nobody likes public speaking. The fear of failure is strong in all of us, but do it anyway. Do it anyway, because being able to fail is the only way we learn and confidence only comes with practice. I remember my first major public speaking event. It was actually a CIHT event in Belfast with Northern Ireland Roads. We were talking in Belfast University about rock slopes on the A2 up in, in Northern Ireland. And I had my other two speakers were very well renowned um, members of Northern Ireland Roads. So when we got there on the evening, they changed the venue on the night to a larger lecture theatre because so many people came and my heart was thumping all the way through. And half an hour after I sat down after my talk, but the feedback was really positive and it gave me the confidence to grow for the next one. So that fear is good. You know, fear is actually excitement. Let's make it, ex ex let's call it excitement. It's much better for you then. So let's all say yes to every positive career opportunity that, that you come across in the next six months. Say no to all the dross, the note taking, the helpful stuff we always do because we haven't got time to do those things and the good stuff. And then at Christmas, take some time to reflect and see how it feels. See how great you are at your job and how confident you feel and how much you deserve that next step and take the step up. As women in this industry, we need to be true to ourselves and try not to be the same as everybody else who've been in the role before us. We always need to, will feel like a post, an imposter if we're trying to be somebody else. So we need to show up as me. You've got your role on your ability and your merit. So be yourself and do things your own way. Show up, speak up, be your whole self and shake things up in the, work, in, in the workplace and you will be great. Many thanks for that, Helen. So really great um, advice uh, um, on how, how to sort of put ourselves forward. And uh, I really like that sort of phrase you use, well, let's not use the fear, you know, fear of failure, but, you know, um, let's translate that into let's get excited about things. And uh, um, but I think it, it's it is it is something that we all suffer from, isn't it? That's sort of like, oh, my goodness, I really can't fail at this. And then we we try and overdo things we over prepare we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and um and unnecessarily actually because you know uh, as women we are good we are very very good and we need to have that confidence that inner confidence um our, ourselves and a lot of um this imposter syndrome is self-inflicted um it's not other people telling us we can't do these things it's um ourselves sort of uh, uh, making making our lives quite hard and it's quite exhausting if you if you do suffer with it because you're always having to deal with it but I like that the idea of you know being the expert and um, being that sort of role model so thank you so much for for that some great stuff and I think we'll probably come back to the two two Helens in a minute um, with some questions 
But let me just remind you all, please do post some questions or some comments in the, um, the questions um, tab. Do, do keep coming, uh, coming back with those because we can then um, take those through to the two to um, Helen's and ask them for some feedback on, on comments that you might have or experiences actually you've had or things that have really worked for you to overcome um, imposter syndrome. So if we can share some of those experiences, that would just be um, fabulous as well. Um, our next uh, contributor is um, Deborah Sims. Um, we have a video that I'm hoping all the technology will go uh, right with this and that um, we will be able to play the video in, a, in just a second or so. But Deborah Sims is our immediate past president, as an immediate as in yesterday, she handed over uh, the baton to our new president. And um, Deborah is a senior lecturer in the School of Engineering at the University of, of Greenwich. Um, she's a STEM ambassador, and um, because she's a STEM ambassador, she's actually um, doing some work, STEM work in her school um, at, at the moment, this afternoon. So sends her apologies not to be here um, live. But she is one of the great advocates of, of women in our industry. And she is a fabulous role model as well. And she's a real, really invests in the sort of the, the professional reviews and mentoring of a lot of our young professionals coming through with their professional qualifications. So she's, she's um, um, a fabulous um, contributor to, to supporting all of us and bringing us all up uh, and making us feel confident. So, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed as we now try and see if we can get the video to actually connect and, and work. So over, is it to you, Kira? Hello. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I'm delighted to be part of this very important CIHT event on imposter syndrome to mark International Women in Engineering Day. I'm Deborah Sims, and I'm the immediate past president of CIHT, and I have over 35 years experience as a road safety engineer, highway engineer, asset manager and academic. I vividly remember my viva at university. When I was so nervous, the room started spinning, I felt sick and I thought I was going to collapse. That experience generated a huge fear of public speaking, which stayed with me for several years, as I firmly believed that that was something I could not do. All these years later, my job now involves standing up in front of large lecture theatres and as CIHT president, giving speeches on a regular basis. It turns out I can do public speaking and indeed I really enjoy it. Overcoming imposter syndrome was critical to my career and my personal development. Imposter syndrome affects everyone at some point in their careers. You may be surprised to find that even the most confident of people experience anxiety and a sense that they're pretending to be something they're not. It affects men and women, although I think for, for various reasons, women tend to suffer from imposter syndrome more frequently and more intensely than men. The reasons for this are perhaps obvious. Girls are held to higher standards by their parents and carers. They impose higher standards on themselves. And because our industry has more men than women, we often find ourselves in the minority. In my experience, many capable, intelligent and professional women are reluctant to put themselves forward, to promote their achievements and to take on more demanding and responsible roles. Girls and young women may be told by teachers and careers advisors that they're not suitable for jobs in engineering, that they're not clever enough, that they will struggle in a male dominated environment or that they're better suited to traditional female roles. And incidentally, I'm not keen on the phrase male dominated. I think it gives a false impression of our industry. I prefer male friendly because many of the organizations, systems and processes have developed to suit men rather than women simply because men are in the majority in our industry. I recommend that you read Invisible Women by Caroline Criado Perez to find out more about this topic. Girls that choose engineering are usually in the minority, sometimes very significantly. And this means they may feel self-conscious and the focus of unwanted attention. 
like me when I was giving my Viva, I'm aware that many female students struggle with in-class presentations. I try to support them, make the lecture room a safe space and congratulate them when they've done a good job. I certainly don't want anyone to have the experience that I had. Incidentally, in my experience, female students are hardworking, conscientious and capable and often achieve better degrees than some of their male counterparts. This may be due to the resilience they develop by choosing engineering and managing the challenges they face. As a lecturer, I tend to meet young women who have successfully applied for university and secured a place. Although as a STEM ambassador, I go into schools and meet girls considering engineering. And as you might expect, I do everything I can to encourage them. For example, I believe that anyone considering engineering should undertake a work placement. This can be very confidence boosting because it demystifies engineering and shows what an interesting, varied and useful profession it is. And this advice carries through to women early in their careers. Gaining a range of experience is essential for building confidence, knowledge and professional networks. For all engineers, but especially women, it's a great idea to get site experience to understand the construction process. It can be too easy to stay on the design side and not get your boots dirty. In my experience, women enjoy being part of a team and making a positive contribution to society. This is both worthwhile and understandable, but it sometimes comes at the expense of personal aspiration and ambition. Women may stay in a role longer than a man and not apply for other jobs because they feel committed to their team and don't want to let them down by moving on. This may be due to a lack of confidence in their ability to secure a more senior job or in their competence to be successful in that role. Research shows that women apply to jobs where they tick all the boxes while men will apply for jobs where they meet perhaps only 80% of the requirements, believing they can be trained or acquire the remaining 20% once they're in the role. And there are many other factors influencing women's choices to aim higher. Career progression routes may not be clear for some women and they may struggle to find female role models within their organisations. Imposter syndrome can generate a desire to prove oneself, resulting in overworking, burnout and being overly self-critical. Engineers tend to be task focused and can be blunt if mistakes are made. Men may blame processes, systems, budgets, tools, management and other people. Whereas women often internalise and personalise criticism even when they're not to blame. Perhaps we all need to become a little bit more thick skinned on occasions. So how can engineering help people overcome imposter syndrome? Well, in lots of ways. I've already mentioned female role models, and I think this is a key area. If young women see other women in senior roles and hear their stories, that helps them aim high and envisage a more ambitious career path. As a young professional, I encourage you to find a mentor to support and advise you. If there are senior women in your organisation, I would hope that they would support you. But of course, men can be allies and mentors too. And if there's someone in a job that you'd hope to do in the future with values that align to your own, then just ask them for advice. Women's networks can enable women to connect across organisations and are useful in building confidence, sharing experiences and connecting senior women with early career staff. I'd also encourage you to engage with professional bodies such as CIHT. Your regional committee would be delighted to hear from you and there are lots of opportunities for you to network with other professionals in your region. Other organisations such as Women in Transport and the Women's Engineering Society are also great places to meet other women and explore issues relevant to you as a professional in a predominantly female space. This is a great time to be a woman in highways and transportation. There are significant skill shortages and by developing your expertise, you will enhance your career, career prospects and be best placed to take advantage of opportunities as they arrive. Women bring a range of skills to our industry, including, usually, great communication and creativity and a fresh approach. The need to address climate change is ever more urgent and employers are looking for people who are able to focus on these issues. So if you experience imposter syndrome, recognise that you're not alone. Everyone experiences this and it's more common than you think. Focus on what you've done to get where you are, the qualifications you've gained, 
the excellent marks you've achieved, the successful projects you've worked on and the positive feedback you've had from colleagues and managers. Try not to compare yourself negatively with others, but learn from best practice and behaviours that you admire. Think about how important it is that there is a woman in your role representing women and girls and the larger community. Take opportunities to build your confidence, such as giving presentations, taking on new projects and roles, and engaging in training and development. Prepare well and always tell yourself you're excited, you're not nervous. Invite feedback from colleagues and supervisors, and in most cases, you'll be surprised by how positive this is. But of course, do ask for things that you can improve on. Take these, this advice seriously and develop action plans to address them. If you have a disaster, just learn from it and move on. No one is perfect and there's always room to improve. And we're all of us learning throughout our lives. And if you're a manager or a colleague of someone who's experiencing imposter syndrome, be gentle with them. Have a quiet word to encourage and support them. Provide them with opportunities to show their competence and skills without putting too much pressure on them. If possible, enable them to mentor or supervise a more junior member of staff, as this can be especially empowering. And always remember to praise, thank and congratulate them for good work, as when times are busy, we don't always remember to do this. Finally, I'd encourage you to support your colleagues and look out for each other. Tell them when they've done a good job, give them constructive feedback if you think it would be helpful, and make sure you challenge behaviours, language and attitudes that you feel are inappropriate within your workplace. I believe it's absolutely vital that we make transport a safe, welcoming and exciting environment for all of our colleagues. And this needs us all to be allies for each other. So enjoy International Women in Engineering Day and take the opportunity to reflect on how fabulous you are and the amazing contribution that you're making to our profession. Thank you. Well, great, and um, that uh, uh, a very inspiring uh, words from from Deborah there, and uh, she is um, really wanted to be with us. So, if you have any particular questions for that are specific to Deborah, then she's very happy to to uh, take them, you know, and and come back to you. So, if you do have anything very specific, put them in the questions, um, please, and we will we will come back to you on that. But again. Okay, Things that she was mentioning was around be your authentic self. Um, you know the, the 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 thing around you know um, keep on building your confidence and and use feedback in a very positive uh, way because actually both um, things that re reinforce the good things that you do and the areas that you can improve on are so important. But for managers, it's the way you communicate that I think is quite critical. So you build someone up. Um, we don't want to knock people down. And of course, Deborah is um, a perfect example of a role, role model, but anyone can be a role model. And we are developing um, lots of role models uh, for use for our CHT members. So if any of you on this webinar uh, would like to put yourself forward as a role model, doesn't matter what stage in your careers you are, please do get in touch. And again, that's probably something we should all, all be doing as, um, you know, sort of saying, yeah, yeah, I can make a difference. I can support my, my uh, fellow women in the profession. So if you do want to become a role model, please do get in touch with us and we will, we will profile you. Okay, now gonna open this up to some questions. So if we can have um, the two Helens back um, in, in view, that would be great, please. Right, I've got, I've got, yeah, I've got, I've got two headers, which is, which is fabulous. So, um, please do, do keep on putting your questions in. I'm just going to start off with one question from um, the audience, which I think um, probably um, all of us um, have thought about this or, or seen this in action. And the question is, it's commonly known that men are much more likely to ask for a promotion than uh, or a pay rise than women. Uh, do you have any tips on knowing your worth and being able to communicate that to senior management? So, can I start with Helen S? Yeah, of course you can. It's, it's such a great question and I'm smiling away. Um, because um, 
I think I think I've probably only ever done it once specifically gone and asked for a pay rise in 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 the job that I had and it was quite a long time ago I'm not going to say who the employer was because it I, I think it would have been the same anywhere and even though I know it's actually in a sort of pseudo job share it wasn't really a job share but there was somebody doing exactly the same job as me and was earning 50 percent more than I was guess what was not a girl um, and I was simply sent away with a flea in my ear of, um, I'm trying to think, I mean, how old was I? I was probably in my late thirties, uh, sent away with a flea in my ear. He's so much more experienced than you, but I knew that I was performing better than he was. Um, and, um, and, and I just took it. Um, the equal pay legislation was in place, but I, I knew that, you know, any mention of equal pay, um, would have been career suicide for me back then. Um, but I, the good news is um, that I think times have changed, and I think most, um, uh, you know, most uh, grown-up organisations. I guess it depends who you work for, but most of the large blue-chip organisations already screen for equal pay and gender pay gap. And so I think we're in a much more um, a much more receptive um, situation than, than we were when I last asked for a pay rise. Um, and I think having the confidence to have an evidence-based discussion uh, with your line manager, um, it is much, much easier. Now, you know, I'm in a position now, a very luxurious position, I think, where I, I genuinely don't feel that I'm paid less than my male counterparts. I don't know for a fact, to be honest, but I don't feel that I am. Um, but I've moved organisation a couple of times um, in, in the last 10 years, and I think that's helped. And I think it's a crying shame if people, if women feel that they have to move organization in order to be paid equally, a real crying shame. So although I've never personally successfully done it, <laughs> um, my plea to people in that situation, to women in that situation, is to be cool, calm, collected, evidence-based, um, and if necessary, I certainly wouldn't start with the with, with the, the reference to, to equal pay, but that's your stop. That's your that's your backstop. Is that you can refer to equal pay. But I would always keep that in my back pocket because I don't think you should need to do that in this day and age. I don't. I don't know what I don't know what Helen's reflections are. <laughs> Fascinating to hear. I, I, I agree. I think you should keep an eye on your gender pay gap for your business. You know that's available for everybody's business for the last five years now, and it's a difficult thing to move. And if you look at your competitors you'll see that nobody's really moving the gender pay gap. But that's not about equal pay, that's about how many people there are up and down, down the business. But it's a nice one to kind of know, well, what are you doing about the gender pay gap? I think I, can, I, sh I should be moving up the business and I can help you with your gender pay gap because if you give me the promotion that I deserve um, I, and the pay that goes with that promotion, therefore that should help your gender payback uh, numbers. So we could have that in our back pocket, but it is very difficult. It, it you ha, you do need to be calm. I don't think I've ever done it successfully, um, but I think it is helpful that some of our major clients in our sector are have banded every role in their business, and so are very transparent. You know, in this role band, you will be paid between this and this, because as women, I think we're less likely to go for a new role if we don't know that you're going to get paid more you know there's, there's lots of other things that you that make you want to stay so if you're not going to get paid more then what's the point in moving you know so so i think as as the businesses move on i think we will see more and more people going well actually we're gonna have to say what we're paying because because we're we're not getting people to apply because we're not saying what we're paying but i agree yeah. with you helen that, that equal pay isn't the issue really anymore i think we have got there i think we've nailed that now well i hope we have getting there let's hope so and uh, but <laughs> thank you for that uh, another question is really around um what the employer or professional bodies like cht could or should be doing to support women's careers and sort of an understanding that actually a lot of women do do suffer from imposter syndrome so we hold back in applying for that job or you know um pushing ourselves forward so what what because we've been talking about individuals what we could do as individuals but what can CHT do or employers do more of that would be supportive do you think so going go back to he helen s and perhaps start with you 
Yeah, sure. I think it's a great question. Um, for me, this all comes down to visible role models. Uh, I mean, I remember not that long ago when I was, I'm in rail now, but um, I bobbed around a bit and I was in the water in the water sector and I was horrified to see one of the institutions, I won't say which one, the one I'm a member of, <laughs> not, the, not, not this one, um, it ran, ran, a, ran, a, ran a panel discussion um, with, a, with a great big feature in their affiliated magazine uh, talking about experiences in, the, in, in water utilities. And I was just horrified. I'm trying to think how long ago it was, maybe 15 years ago. And it was it was pale male and stale, you know, not a single woman on the panel, not a single person of colour on the panel. And I wrote in and I was just horrified. And I wasn't suggesting they necessarily asked me, I mean, they could have done. I was engineering director for one of the water utilities, but there were squillions of, of um, senior women that they could have asked to be on the panel. So um, I don't see that happening anywhere near as much these days. Um, but, but so, so you will you will always get a smattering of diversity, and I like to talk about diversity in the broadest perspective, not just gender diversity. So I, I don't see that anywhere near as much anymore. Um, but I think there's further that we can go. So making sure that there it, there, there are plenty of female voices um, and other diversity voices around the table, um, giving thought leadership pieces, having high profile roles within the institution, chairing panels being put forward to speak in the media, because the media will ask for uh, thought leadership when, when, unfortunately, when something dreadful happens, but also when something wonderful happens, like the, you know, the opening of the Victoria Line, I'm sorry, Elizabeth Line, Victoria Line was a while ago. Mm. Um, uh, and, and so I think there's, a, there's definitely a role for the institutions there in making sure that without lowering the bar of expertise, because there's absolutely no need to do that, and that's more damaging, you know, let's not, let's not put women forward who, who are not competent to, to provide the thought leadership but there are plenty of us around um, and I get a little bit tired and I suspect that, that Sue and Helen you feel the same I get a little bit tired of being asked to do an interview for the trade press and then all they want to talk about is my gender and my journey through my career not the really cool things that I've done not the really cool engineering project that I'm delivering they want to talk about gender and it kind of irritates me a bit what a shame what a lost opportunity that's brilliant. And the other, Helen, any, any, anything further? Uh, I was on, I was lucky enough to go to the International Women in Engineering Day event on Tuesday um, that was online as well at the Royal Academy because of the rail strip. Um, but um, they were talking about um, peer coaching. So finding somebody of your same level to be able to talk to about all the different things that that you you your your issues and stuff and I thought actually I'd love a peer coach I think that's a great idea so it, it's something that you find sort of organically it was somebody who who is is like you that at about the same level that that actually you can completely separate from your own business but you can say oh I'm, I'm I've got this blocker what do I do to, to get past it and I think that's quite a good way of if we could try and and facilitate that. I think if the institution could try and, and facilitate that, that would be great because because actually having a buddy or somebody that you can be accountable for is really good for career progression. I think. So. And I think all the things that Deborah have said, she, Deborah nailed it in that video. <laughs> Now, I'm very aware of the time. It's three o'clock and we've still got quite a few questions. Um, so what I'm going to say, because I know people will be needing to get to other other meetings, is that we will um, try and um, go back to people or, or post some question and uh, some answers to questions um, uh, one way or another, because someone was just asking um, about you know when you get interrupted i think it was helen s when you were talking about you get interrupted or or you say something and then a man says something two minutes later and everybody really listens to what they say and so it's good point and someone was just asking so if this keeps happening what do you do do you do you correct them? do you what what do you do do you just sort of stand up and sort of like i said well i've just said that so very quickly what what do you do? And then um, as you're doing that for Helen T, I was going to say um, one one tip that you will give us all uh, to go with. We'll close on one tip. So Helen, uh, what do you do if it keeps happening? OK, so it's really difficult to call it out yourself really, really hard. I think um, if somebody does interrupt your expertise with their confidence, 
um, then you do have to deal with it yourself. Well, it depends whether you're in an open forum. If these, and, and so that, and that's just difficult. Um, and sometimes you just have to let them finish talking. Um, really, really tough. Uh, in an open forum, for me, I think there's a real role of strong meeting chair. Um, and there's a very strong role for male allies. It's much, much more powerful if you're in that situation in a meeting, if somebody other than you, and in particular, if it's a, if it's a man, but it doesn't have to be, but if somebody other than you says, oh, hang on a minute, I'm sure, isn't that what Helen was just talking about just now? Helen, would you like to just, you know, and I think, you know, the, the, the importance of male allies is, is, is extraordinary and the power of male allies is extraordinary, but also making sure that people who are chairing important meetings, make sure that everybody gets a voice. And again, that's not just a gender thing. Um, it can be if somebody's, you know, now we have so many hybrid meetings, there's a skill to chairing a hybrid meeting to make sure that everybody has a voice and if somebody sat on the screen dialing in from wherever, if they've got their hand up, a little yellow hand up, that the meeting chair is, is keeping an eye on that. So for me, making sure that you chair in a considerate way, um, I place a particular importance on making sure that I chair in a considerate way and I make sure that everybody has a voice. And if somebody sat there and their body language tells me that they've got something to say, I make sure I draw it out. So for me, it's, um, it, it, it's, it, it's difficult for you to do it yourself. Um, but from an organisational perspective, making sure that people are trained, the, the wider senior workforce is trained um, to speak out and to chair considerately. Brilliant. Great, great advice there, Helen. Thank you very much. And, and over to, to Helen T for one tip that we, you can leave us with. I, I, think, I think my tip would, I mean, it echoes what Helen's just said. Actually, we can all be allies. We've all got a level of privilege, even if we're just starting out as a as a grad. I mean, I know our grads are amazing and and are are confident. They're a confident lot. See somebody's been spoken over, or uh, it doesn't matter how senior you are. You can always stand up and be an ally for, for the person beside you if they need it. Brilliant, brilliant words there. And allyship is so so important. So. Um, I know there's loads of questions still in there and we just haven't had time to to get around to them, but it, what it indicates is maybe we should do another session on imposter syndrome. It has generated so many different questions and uh, an hour's webinar clearly isn't isn't sufficient to explore all this. So we may well be coming back to the two to Helen to take this forward a little bit more. But I just wanted to thank you both so much for your time, for your um, brilliant reflections and advice as well and to thank everybody on the webinar I hope you've got something from this um, as I would say we will be doing other other sessions um, going forward and I suspect this might well come up um, again because it is something that resonates with with all of us so so much so on that note a very happy International Women in Engineering Day to everybody enjoy the rest of your day thanks very much and goodbye thank you, thank you. bye